but yeah. confrontation isn't um, conflict. You know, and confrontation is, hey, can you just clarify for me what you mean by this statement, just so I'm, I'm, I can share an understanding with what you mean. Yeah. Also, we just stay curious. We and just stay. It's hard when you're having. It, it gets easier, Kate. Hi, I'm Julie Gillespie, your host from the Conversations with Julie podcast. We've been quiet this year on the podcast front because we've been in organisations speaking with leaders about what matters most to them and helping them to transform the way they connect. We had the opportunity of working with Kate Baxter, one of the leaders from Little Real Estate. They hold REO OK Day as a very important event across their organisation because they want to show what it looks like to care for one another in a meaningful way. We sat down for, a, a, would have been about over an hour and a half, having a conversation about what can we do to set up a safe space before asking someone if they're okay. And in that, there are these golden nuggets that we really wanted to share with you, our podcast listeners, to be able to understand the work that we can do before we get into the room with someone to see how they're doing. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Look forward to hearing your feedback on this one. We'll see you at the end. Thank you. Welcome, Julie. Thank you so much for supporting us here at Little Real Estate with our Are You OK Mental Health webinar. I'm so excited to have you with us today. Always a pleasure, Kate. Always a pleasure. Now, today I wanted to have a conversation with you about setting a safe space. Um, and so Are You OK is a really, it's an amazing opportunity for us to go around and ask people for, are you OK? But can you help share and give us an understanding of how we can create the right intent as we go talking to people and asking them this question? Well, and that's such a great question because it's thoughtful and mindful of intention and purpose. You know, why are we asking this anyway? You know, the, the great Australian vernacular is, hey, how you doing? And we keep on going. It's like, bye, you know, check is. And it's a greeting. It's, it has so little meaning. And I think yeah. that's where some of the problems in Australia have come about from the Are You OK Day initiative is that it's just this fob off, this pass off type of sentimentality. I've, I've done my job. I've said it. Tick, done. But when it comes with, well, what, how can we set ourselves up to ask this question, you know, this intention and this purpose, it changes how we're going to do it. It's no longer a reactionary thing. It becomes a response to something. Yeah. Yeah. And that response to something is, I'm not going to ask everyone, are you okay, Day? I'm going to think about those around me and just go, who, what have I missed? Who have I missed? Yeah. Who stepped back? Who have I not seen lately? Who's been kind of walking around with a cloud over their head? Who's been really grumpy lately? Yeah. And why am I thinking that? Why am I seeing that? And taking those moments to understand why I would want to ask that particular person, are you okay? Especially if it's not a normal thing for me to go up and say to someone. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think when you go at it with intent and care rather than a tick box system um, or to everybody, yeah. if I ask 50 people, are you okay? And I actually stop and pause and wait for them to answer me. There's your day gone. The, yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's the impact on me? Hearing, what's the cost? What's the cost? I love yeah. that. Love that. We talked about that a lot through your mental health first aid training yeah. is what is the cost of? Um, and you also shared an amazing tidbit, which is off script, but I want to share it with our audience as well, is is silence is, is agreement. And that was something that you talked about through a whole mental health first aider. We'll pick that up a little bit later. Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a bag of beans, not even yeah, a yeah, can yeah. of beans. That's a bag of beans, that one. I, okay. I do go off script, so bear with that's me. That's all right. So as we're asking with intent and we're talking and, and, and we're committed to Are You OK Day, because I know that I know that in at Little it's a really powerful day for us, yeah. um, how do you, I suppose the better frame is, is how, how can you, what can get in the way? of asking, are you okay? What, what are the, the challenges that people might refrain from saying or going towards this intention? 
It's a uh... Look, I, in doing the training for the mental health first aid for over five years now, there I think we've just tipped over the 1,000 people that, you know, have gone through the training with, with me, which is nice. amazing. And yeah. the stories I've heard is fantastic. But every single time um, that I've run training, every single time I've sat with someone as a mental health first aid instructor, um, they're all saying, I don't know what to say. What's the right thing to say? What if I say the wrong thing? You know, mm -hmm. what if they explode and react? And, you know, what if I, you know, I'm getting in on their business and la, 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 you know, the ruminating and the the chatter. And, you know, there's this, this pause that we have to take and just go, why have you made this problem about you? Mm. I nod because I agree. Because even as I'm thinking about it, Julie, and I've got people in my brain that I'm going, I'm going to, I'm not going to wait for, are you okay? To, I'm going to go ask them, are you okay? And in my brain, I went, what if I hear something I don't want to hear? Mm. What if What if I can't help them? What if I can't commit to doing all the, so, so all of a sudden, I don't even know what's going on and I have an indirect personal reflection on me. You've how made do I it about, yeah. you've made it about you. So you've how do we, not do that or what what are the okay. steps or boundaries around creating a safe space for me or for whoever's asking this question okay can i'm just going to share a screen with you this is something that i do in the compassionate conversations training so this is a program that i've built specifically for this stuff and what it does it this talks about preparing yourself before we do anything we've noticed that something's going on it's like i wonder you know i wonder what is happening for them and being able to reflect first of self and being able to go, why am I feeling this? What is it about the situation that, you know, I'm seeing and I'm thinking about, does it affect me? Does it, you know, what are, what are the instances that are going on? What's the situation? Um, why am I thinking these things? And then looking at the skills that we have, you know, we're humans, that's a skill set. Just, be, yeah. just simply being human is a skill set. If you're a mental health first aider, there's a whole different set, set of skills that you've gained, you know, through our um, action plan, algae. What are my biases? Now, this is a fun one mm. because oftentimes the, what if I have to do this for them is a judgment. What if they, you know, don't give me an answer that I want to hear? That is a judgment. Every time we go through that process, you're like digging up your bias potatoes, you know, mm. and you're just picking them up and it's just like owning and owning, owning. And every single time we do that is a judgment of that person, that they're not able, they're not capable, they're broken, they need fixing. I'm the one that can come in and be their superhero. These what a yeah. are all judgments. Yeah. That's yeah. what judgment looks like. You know, being nice is a judgment. Yeah. You know, because it's like, oh, I'm going to come in and, and make sure that they're happy and make sure that everything is comfortable for them and, and they're, ha you know, able to do the things that they need to do and they're going to be well again. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So all yeah. of these expectations that we're putting on them and or it just, I, I can only imagine it's creating what's well, leading them to be masking and or just telling you what you want to hear anyway. In some because, circumstances. Because oftentimes they're your judgments. Mm. And which can become a contributing factor for, you know, what's going on. But having a look at the environment, because so often we see the problem and the solution within the individual. Yeah. And that's that's not how it works. Oftentimes how someone's responding, reacting and feeling is incredibly appropriate to the situation or environment they're in. Yeah. And so what are the contributing factors? What are those things that are making that happen? Why, what are they responding and reacting to? Because let's believe their feelings to be true. Yes. Believe, so just we, believe them. We look at the human first and we trust what they're telling us yep. is exactly their reality. Yeah. So it's see the person, not the problem. So it's, yeah, it's looking at those contributing factors. What are the things that are in play here that are contributing to how that person's feeling? Because what I want you to do is just believe their feelings to be true. Yeah. Not up to you. The moment that you think otherwise, you're judging. Yeah. There's and no other action. There's no other action is apart from, are you okay? Hmm. And then believing what they're saying is true. No this solution. Is, no... This is before that even. 
Yeah. This is before yeah. you say anything. I don't want you saying a single thing yet. Before you've come to this place. Before don't you. Don't say anything until you come to this place. That's it. So no assumptions, no thinking you know what they're doing or what's happening around them. Just literally my intent is I will ask this and my, and my knowing internally is I will believe that their feelings and the story that they're telling is real. For them. For we, them. Yeah, yeah. Because remember, like, okay, I run a business. I've been running businesses for a very long time. And I've come to realize that their truth is not always my truth. Yes. How they see, view their perceptions, you know, doing all of these things that, you know, if I still believe them to be true, it doesn't mean that I agree with them. Yes. Because I've got a business to run, you know, and they've got a contract to uphold and we've got a contract to them to uphold. Yeah. But what in this mix of things, it could be a contributing factor. Yeah. This is the interplay, right? Yeah. Because once we've reflected, once we've kind of untangled this stuff that happens in our head, which is our safe space, because what it does, it takes us out of us personally and brings it to here. Yeah. Oh, we're looking at it. There's a bit of reflection and perception. And when we've got it out here, guess what? The perspective's a little bit different, isn't it? It's a one degree shift out of us. Yeah. Well, I certainly, I, I certainly don't feel the personal connection and I don't feel the saviour or the martyr. I actually come in in a situation where I am curious, mm -hmm. caring, yeah, um, and invested to support or just to hear a story. I have nothing else coming to me. I don't have a solution. I don't have to do it. I, that's my key, right? Done. So I've set myself up to have a safe conversation because then you can plan yeah because you've set you've given yourself perspective and you know a, a different perception to it you've get, allowed yourself to be okay despite yeah. whatever else is going to happen because it's not about you unless it yeah. is and that's a different conversation we need to talk about yeah, absolutely but it is an interesting topic um because I think we we all sometimes wake up and think that the world does revolve around us, that we are the shining star. But in reality, I know. Just, for, just for ourselves, not necessarily for everybody else. No, people don't think about us as much as we think they do. Yeah, it's not about you. No. Yeah. A, how great's that? <laughs> I actually think it takes a huge amount of pressure off. Because this is where the expectations sit. You know, yes. when we come into planning, you know, there's self-awareness of self-expectations. You know, what's my expectations of this person? Have I clarified that with them? Now, what is my expectations of where this is going to go? Like what this conversation is going to be able to unveil or develop or, you know, need? Um, what are the expectations can I say to this person about mm. the conversation? Because this is where intent comes in. Yeah. You know, and I want to clarify concerns with myself. So, which means I'm looking for data points, facts. Yeah. yeah. Not the detail. Not the, the detail. Facts. The facts. And sometimes in chronological order. Yes. It takes us, takes the emotional hook out of it. Yeah. And then, you know, in clarifying those concerns, you know, what are my resources available before I even step into the field of have, having this conversation? Yeah. You know, is um, are you a resource for someone within your organisation? Yes, you are. Yes. Um, is your employee assistance program, your EAP a resource? Absolutely. You know, there's Beyond Blue, there's Black Dog, there's the, you know, Head to Health. You know, there's all of these organisations that are resources. Wonderful. They have the answers. Yes. Hey, so I don't, I don't have to. <laughs> Again, the pressure's the pressure's off, right? The pressure's off. Both the I, same know. Way. I know. I know. You can unarmor. Like all of a sudden, the swords don't need to come in. The protection doesn't need to come in. All of the components that create fear, biases, and ownership of something that's not in your control. This process is letting all of that go. It says you don't have to be the expert. Yep. We've got amazing literature. Um, you know, <laughs> Are amazing. You really marked that up <laughs> amazing framework that yeah. allows us to ask are you okay without owning the whole problem and without having to fix anything just be in the conversation 
Yeah. And it's two way, you know, yeah. that, and there's two way conversation um, because, you know, then what are your obligations here? You know, th this is where that sits into play. I love how this is our conversation is kind of traversing this, you know, mapping out. Um, what are your obligations here? If I'm a leader of this person, well, I've got a different set of ob obligations. Um, if I'm the peer, I still have obligations because, yeah. you know, there's the, well, there's so much research in and around this um, from Drs. Nagoski, who wrote the book on burnout. Um, they talk about processing stressors that lead to burnout and things like that. They talk about the cure for burnout cannot be and should never be within self-care and within in the individual. It's all of us caring for each other. Yeah, a community. But a community. When we look at safety modelling, you know, it's never, you know, an individualistic thing. You know, it's um, me looking after myself and having the backs of those around me and watching out for others. So not only is there just this one set of eyes on what I'm doing, but I've also got 10, 20, 30, you know, however, however big your community is, you know, yeah. sets of eyes on me, making sure that I stay safe. Now that's not only our health, you know, and safety, you know, regulations and systems, you know, and protocols. But when we look at our First Nations culture, that's their view of safety. They don't have a word for safety in the no. way that we do. Because there's this, it's not that there's an agency in the individual, it's a collective. Yeah. And so we have this obligation as human beings to care for self and each other yeah. in a way that others want to be cared for. Oh, okay. Yeah. So hold on a second. So the, <laughs> firstly, I agree with you, right? But hold on a second. So the good old ritual of treat oh. others the way they would like to be treated. Are you it's now? bullshit. Okay. It's bullshit. Because that's what you've just said. So, and I completely agree. I, I actually don't want you, Julie, and I, or Ben, I adore you, to treat me the way you want to be treated. I actually want you to treat me the way I want to be treated. I know. Um, how am I going to find out what that is, though? You're going to have to talk to me. You're going to I have know. to have a good old yarn and we're going to have to get a bit deep and we're going to have to give real feedback yeah. when that line's blurred Yeah. so that you know what my standards are. Like I'm yeah. obligated if I want to have a relationship with you to do that, surely. And that's never from a monologue. No. So I'm going to unshare the, the screen for it because I want to talk about that for a second. I'm just going to stop share. Here we are. So that's never from a monologue. And we're, we're talked, we um, hear about this active listening, you know, and it talks about this singular sitting and listening to a monologue and then being able to parrot back, reflect back, you know, some of these things. It's still a monologue. Yeah. Whereas for us to get to know each other, we do have to have a conversation, which is this two way piece. As yeah. I'm finding out how you want to be treated, interspersed through that, my values crop up, what matters to me crop, crops up, what I care about crops up, and same for you. And those sometimes are in alignment, sometimes they're not. Mm -hmm. But if they're not, that's okay, because guess what? I can adapt and just go, ah, oh, that makes sense to me of where you're at, and I'm going to treat you in that way because I respect you first before I even find these things out. Yeah. Because then through respect, I'm going to find connection. Yes. And so respect and connection in asking, are you okay? Mm. How critical is that to having an authentic conversation? <laughs> okay. So I'm just going to refer to my notes here. There, there's something that I, I need to share on this and it's something that I've just come to understand to be true. Um, so there's a, um, audio book that I've just listened to called Sand Talk from Tyson Yunkaporta, um, an uh, Indigenous uh, man, not an elder of his community, um, but he's a PhD. Um, he's sitting in the intersection of looking at a sense-making mechanism. Yes, yeah, sense-making mechanism. Talk yeah. to me about it. Okay. So, because we live in this complex system, right? And what he was talking to is that what comes first is respect, aligning with values and protocols of introduction, you know, setting, you know, boundaries and, and you know, this is the work of that spirit stuff. And we always, we have respect first. 
Mm -hmm. Then connect, developing strong relationships and routines of exchange that are equal for all involved. Yeah. Uh, then, then talking about reflect, you know, thinking as part of the group, collectively establishing a shared body of knowledge to inform what you will do and then direct acting on that shared knowledge in ways that are negotiated with the all. Mm. And so when we're, I love that so much, when we're asking, are you okay? What we're doing is we're looking at respect first. We're going to prepare ourselves for the conversation because that is respectful. We're, we're setting the ground, we're putting our feet on the ground, we're, we're feeling our space of where we're at. And then what we're doing in part of our planning and reflecting is seeing where this person with us is placing their feet on the ground and, and their perspective and their values and what they care about and yeah. connecting with them at, at that space, looking for those alignment patterns, those storytellings, that awareness that they have of themselves. Mm. So when we ask, are you okay with that intention? It's completely different than, are you okay? Great. Good to see you, mate. It takes a lot, I know. And it seems really complicated. But you just need to know the framework to keep yourself safe and to keep the person next to you that you have great intentions. It's just great framework. And yeah. I think the more you practice it, the more it will just become how you lean into these conversations yeah. versus bulldoze your way through and I look oh, I can own that <laughs> through, through love and through care and sometimes desperation um I can own that hand too but you know yep. thank you to you I'm learning I completely I know I've really doctored this book um <laughs> but it's great content and there's a yep. great process around it that helps me stay safe but keep yep. the people around me safe as I ask mm. are you okay and a lot of that framework and where the intersection of that and, you know, the compassionate conversations work that I do, you know, as, as the other component, the intersection of those things is around compassionate empathy. Yeah. And so compassionate empathy is this balance between logic and emotion. It's the simplest form of putting it. And the logic is something that we hold out here. And we will ask questions. We'll be curious with it. Yeah. But the emotion is how we then connect with that person and yeah. and respect that person and hold that person in love and integrity and, you know, uh, dignity. But we can still balance it with logic. Yes. And we don't so, have to be all in. And so often we either do one or the other. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to be empathetic and to be nice and all of these things, you know, I'm going to care, I'm going to care. Guess what? We're in that problem with that person. Yeah. And we're disempowering them. Or we come in with logic. We'll just get on with it, toughen up. We've got a job to do. Move on, move through. You know, that's it's you, not if that you bad. do it's not that bad. And if you do this, this, and this, you'll be fine. Yeah. Bringing them together. No, balancing them out. Yes. Yeah. I'll take that too. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. we can continue to learn. Yeah. Because when we bring them together, they have to be um, symbiotic. Whereas if we're balancing them, they are each of their own thing. They're holding their own weight through the process. So, yeah, uh, yeah I appreciate yeah. Thank you. Thank you for the clarification. So there's, there's these features and benefits and wonderful things of them, but there's also responsibilities that come along with it. Yeah. You know, there is beauty and form. Like, you know, they, these are the balances that, you know, nature has that, you know, we have, um, relationships need to have. Yeah. And, you know, that's where a compassionate empathy sits in. Yeah. Amazing. A great, a great, fantastic. So could you give us just um, a wrap up, setting a safe space? Mm. It takes a couple of factors and, yeah. you know, there's a consistency to your behaviour and actions. Um, it's uh, coming in with intent and purpose and it's asking permission. It's asking, hey, is it all right that we have a chat because, there's a, you know, I've been concerned about what's been going on in and around us and I just wanted to see how you're doing with that. You know, being able to set up a safe space means that we're going to bring clarity to why we're asking, are, are you okay? Yeah. Because it's the difference between me saying, hey, Kate, great job or, hey, Kate, 
when you did this particular job, what I really appreciated was that you paid this attention to detail. You cared about where people were at and made sure that everyone was on board. There was a lasting impression with the client that they showed their appreciation for as well. Yeah. W which do you want? Oh, please give me the detail, please. For me to be my best, both positive and constructive, give me the detail. Yeah. Or and so Are You OK is about that also. And mm. that, them as an organisation, they've done that too. It's no longer about this Are You OK day because they've got in their programs what comes next. Yeah. Yeah. They know it's more than that. It's a complex system, not a singular system. No. Yes, yes. And, and the evolution of starting a conversation to working through the conversation and the, and the framework has certainly been a great evolution. Um, and I think we've learned significantly huge amounts as a general public from the Are You OK campaigns. They've done a brilliant job. They have. And, you know, the to be able to see more organisations pick it up is wonderful to see. And that yeah. it's not just a singular thing that they do. It's not just a day's event, you know, and that there's more going on within the infrastructure of the organisation. It's part of the very fab strategic fabric of the organization yeah. and that's what I love to see and it's not done often enough yeah but you know with your mental health first aiders you know with the leadership development work that you're all doing are you okay day initiative that you're doing you know there's so many different intersecting you know initiatives that are happening that just makes this part of standard operating procedure uh, absolutely it's our genuine culture um, at little real estate to have a psychologically safe environment um, that we can be our authentic selves on the good days and the really bad days. And we normalise the spectrum um, because I, for one, want to be able to call my boss, who's a legend, I hope she sees this, just so she knows she gets a little shout out, um, to say, hey, I'm having an overwhelmed day. Yep. I'm having an anxious day. I'm having a stress day. I'm having a my life's turned upside down day. Yeah. For her to create space for me, to sit in that and to give me what I need in that. And, and mostly it's just to be heard, but sometimes it needs to be more. Um, and that's, that's, that's great for me. That's where I'm at. Well, and that, you know, takes us into that Viktor Frankl quote, you know, in between uh, stimulus and response is a space. And yeah. in that space, we have a choice. And from that choice, we have freedom and growth. Yep. And so often we go from stimulus to reaction. Yes. So how so, do you find third space? How do you find that centre? And what it does is like it's bringing these two things out and giving yourself time to prepare yourself. Yeah. You know, that planning, that, you know, observing, you know, what have I got? What have they got? What's needed? Where are we at? And being able to balance that logic and emotion and being able to go, all right, I'm now prepared to go in. I've, I've made a choice to go in and ask a question with intent and through that, you know, is freedom for both as mm. well as growth for both. Yeah. And I love yeah. that. I love that too. I love that too. Julie, we could talk about this all day. I know we could. I know it's a topic you could definitely talk yes. to. And I'm, just, <laughs> I'm in a situation where I just get to learn through you and um, via your already amazing knowledge. Um, thank but you I so appreciate situations of gone cattywampus and gone up in the air and, and tilted us off you know, the normal, we've got a skill set then to be able to connect in with others easier and to be able to rely on others to keep us steady and consistent. Whereas without that, we become singular and small and closed in yeah. and dysfunctional. Yeah, well, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. Um, Julie, earlier in the conversation, we, we talked about silence is acceptance. Can yeah. Debunk, share, what, what is what is this meaning? Okay, so the let, let's put a bit of context to it. Um, so when we're listening to someone who's having a tough time, you know, active listening is uh, how I frame it is that we're listening to what the person cares for, what they value and why does this thing matter to them and then believing them. And in that it takes some silences, but also reflection speak and, you know, being with someone in the moment and making it a conversation. Yeah. 
sometimes we need silence to allow someone to process what they're saying and thinking to show that we're not judging their shitty first draft. Um, we've They've said something, we've asked a question, they're gonna you know, reflect and give us their true answer. That type of silence is grace. Yeah. What I'm talking about is, you know, silence is agreement, is this idea of when we walk past something that butts up and misaligns with our values and what we care about and what matters with us, and we yeah. don't say anything. Yes. So we see a behaviour or an act or a situation, whatever it is, it doesn't sit with us in regards to what our standards, values and expectations are mm -hmm. and we walk past it. Or we just or, stay silent and continue a conversation past it. Yeah. In yeah. that person's mind, you thoroughly and absolutely agree with what they've just said or done. And all eyes looking at you doing that think you thoroughly and absolutely agree with what they've just done. Yeah. And this is where we kind of, that model I spoke about before about respect and then connect, it yeah. tips that, you know, and it disregards, you know, um, respect. It disregards connections. It actually dissolves them. Yeah. And it reduces the potentiality for those things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I think, you know, a, a saying that's just popping into my head right now is that the standards we keep are the standards we walk by, um, you know, and, and it really does resonate within me. And I've been silent many a times. Um, so, because I was being nice. Yes. Well, and, you know, what was that my place? Well, really, they're my values, they're my standards. That's what I'm what what conversation I'm willing to have. And it doesn't need to be aggressive. And it no. doesn't need to be confrontational. No. Because it can this is be. sometimes because it needs to be. But yeah. confrontation isn't um, conflict. You know, and confrontation is, hey, can you just clarify for me what you mean by this statement, just so I'm, I'm, I can share an understanding with what you mean. Yeah. Also, we just stay curious. We and just stay. It's hard when you're having. It it gets easier, Kate. It gets so much easier with practice. This is not the Julie of six years ago plus like you know I would have gone straight into react mode if someone had said something I didn't like I would have told him what is saying bullshit like that for I would have come yep. at him and that's conflict yeah you know um but that was um a lot of the situation of what I was in with mental health and well-being and everything else going on around yeah we grow we learn we grow we learn so that but my practice now is if I hear something that you know kind of gives that little red flag or that little something in the stomach or something in the chest or throat, you know, I get a visceral reaction to what's just been said. I can go, hang on, I just want to pause for a second. Can you tell me what you mean by that so I can understand where you're coming from? Yeah. What you're doing, you're giving someone space to reflect on what they've just said. Yeah. Which I think is kindness, deep and compassionate in and of itself. And you're coming from a place without judgment yet. Yeah. Yeah. You're delaying judgment. Yeah, because you're seeking to understand. Yeah. Can you tell me more of what you mean about that yeah. is the shorthand version of it. Yeah. And if by the time it comes out of your mouth, the judgment and how you feel about it won't have formed yet. Yes. And that's what we got to kind of get ahead of, you know, in our brain is like, how did that make me feel? <gasps> and, and then we can't say the anything. Feeling I need to have a behavior attached to that feeling. In this yeah. scenario, we're saying, hey, I heard something. It's not connecting well with me. I'm going to seek to understand more. What was your intent in saying that? What is your experience? What do you know before we decide to attach it to ourselves and then have a behaviour or, or an action to it? Or a feeling. We need to get ahead of how we feel about that. Yeah. We don't want to wait around until we, how we feel about it because we'll never feel like asking it. We're always going to feel on the back foot. We're always going to feel something other than what we genuinely need to or what yeah. is appropriate actually for what's actually happening. Yeah. We allow our story to hijack us. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When it goes back to your conversation before around biases. 
around biases. So when it comes to are you okay in asking the question of it, if we have this in mind of if something comes up that I don't like the sound of, where someone might have a reaction to it of, oh, I'm sick of people asking me if I'm okay, to be able to go, okay, can you tell me more about what's happened to, you know, have you feeling this way? It gives someone the opportunity to say why. You're going to hear the reason. Yeah. Because our first instinct is like, oh, well, fine then, stuff ya. But yeah. if we lean in and, and say, hey, like, what's happened for you to go off like this? Can you tell me about that? You're going to get an answer, but they're also going to be in a position of being heard of why they're pissed off. Yeah. And that's really important to be able to do because they might say, everyone's asking me. It's like, oh, do you think they're asking you without intentional purpose? Or do you think that they have seen something and they're just using this day to be able to kind of say to you, hey, I've noticed that, you know, there's a lot going on at the moment. Do you think it's just a flippant thing or because they care? Yeah. See how we give them options. Give them the options. And I, and if I've done the work, as in I'm prepared, I've disassociated myself about this being about me, it's about this yeah. individual, all of a sudden I don't get defensive whilst they're getting defensive um, and trying to work out why I care about them being up okay so it all connects in in, yeah. in how we go about building connection respect um setting purpose intention having yeah. a plan and approach yeah. and genuinely setting space to say hey are you okay mm. are you okay I'm asking because I know there's a lot going on around us at the moment yeah. And that's why I'm asking. I know it's are you okay day, but I've thought about who I would like to ask this question of. And it's something that I've delayed. Yeah. But I'm using the day as courage to be able to come in and say, I want to know if you're okay. Because I've noticed there's a lot going on for you at the moment. And I just wanted to check in to see how you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Mm, pleasure. It's something that I wanted to be asked over the years. Yeah. I'd look, and, and you know, Julie, I want to be asked. Some days I don't want to be asked because I don't <laughs> actually want to get into it. <laughs> but I think you you would be fairly obvious about when that is. Yes. Yeah. Well, I'd like to think that because <laughs> it normally starts with, I'm not okay today. You need to give me some space. Clarity. It normally starts with that I'm going to turn up differently at the moment because I am overwhelmed, da, 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 da. So I'm just going to need you to be kinder to me because I might not turn up the way you wanted me to turn up. So I let myself off the hook by oh, communicating okay. it. And what I found for my own mental health is 10, 15 minutes later, I've already gotten over my hump. <laughs> that, that is what works for me. And you've I got people to... coming in going, you're all right now? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah again, that was fun, wasn't it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Um, but I have to own it because I, I, I recognise, because I care deeply about the people I work with um, and who report into me, I don't want them ruminating about if I'm short or if I'm different. So it's not actually about me that I share this information with them. It's about protecting them so they know how to turn up to me. So, And it's a protective model because we look at the risk. Yeah. You know, it's not protective of putting a shield up because they're a little different, right? But it's a yeah. protective modelling of yes. I'm bringing clarity because it means that you can't tell stories about this. Yes. Yes. Kate was in a shit yesterday. Yes, she was. She yeah. said <laughs> yes, she was. There we go. Um, yeah, really interesting. Actually, and thank, love yeah, and thank you for sharing that. I think it's important for other people to see the why you do that, how it helps, what the effects are. Because if we don't share examples, it's just words. Yeah. How does this thing actually work? You know, what is the mechanism? of being compassionate? What is the mechanism of these things? And what we've been speaking about today is the mechanism of caring compassionately. What is it? Care personally and challenge directly. You know, it's mm. this, 
yeah, which is radical candor are the foundations of that. Like, yeah. you know, so many models sit in this balance between emotion and logic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as you said, when we balance them out, quick learner, quick learner, um, you know, we can mitigate the cost and yeah. create a supportive environment that's really authentic to what your intentions were from the very beginning. Which allows you to treat others how they want to be treated. So Julie, can can you share with me a little bit more around how we can balance logic and emotion um, and how that helps us stay safe and, and set some really solid boundaries um, through the process? Absolutely. I'm going to share my screen again because I think this will help us to give us a visualisation of what this looks like. So what we're going to see here is the balance scales. You know, the, this is kind of what it looks like, right? This, And to keep our arms up like that for any period of time, that is exhausting. Yeah. So sometimes we need to let one down and, and lift the other. So in terms of boundary setting, the, the balance of um, logic and emotion and so that emotion part is mutual care and support, respectful communication. And then when we're ba balancing that with the mutual accountability, respected and boundaries, what we're doing is realizing that we can care for and hold someone accountable for their behaviors and actions and our own at the same time. It brings us clarity to what we're asking, why we're asking, um, and that we're there to empower someone through their process. Yeah. And that sets a really clear defined boundary in and of itself without it being a brick wall. Yeah. I'm not going to feel anything because this is just a task and you're here to get a job done. No, it's awful. What we're doing is like, I, I care about you, Kate, and I see that there's a lot going on for you. And I know in our relationship over the years, you know, that's been, you know, set in, you know, mutual care and support. The other aspect that I want to bring us into is how do we hold each other accountable to make sure that A, the job gets done, that's the task focused, but that when you do need something that you're going to ask me, because that's part of accountability. Yeah. And when I need something of you, there's a freedom for me to ask you because we've got this balance between emotion and logic, yeah. mutual care and support and mutual accountability. And that sets up a relationship of respect, but also this is how trust is formed. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and so without trust, I know we use respect and connection at the very beginning of your um, video content, but trust to be able to lean into these conversations and, and to not always save someone else, but to be able to ask for help creates that mutual respect across the whole process. Yeah. And and remember that, you know, trust and um, these things are, you know, aren't binary. You know, they aren't have or have not. You know, so often we see trust as you either have it or you don't. Yes. I don't think trust, same as respect, sits out here. I don't think it does. I think it comes in with here. You know, this is part of spirit, part of heart, part of how we turn up. I walk into the room trusting and respecting every person in it. Yeah. And then I'm through connection and through mutual support and mutual care and accountability, I'm going to understand the boundaries of that trust and respect. The boundaries of the trust and respect. My own boundaries and Your the boundaries, boundaries of those that are around me. Singular as well as collective. Because that then becomes a conversation, right? Yeah. So um, so often we don't trust ourselves. We're waiting for other people to trust us to feel valued, right? Um, so this is where that sits in. Whereas one of my core values is I belong here. Yes. So Brene Brown does up, an amazing podcast yeah. or story on this, but please, I don't want to ruin yeah. your story. No, but... no, no, no. And and I, I, I won't go into the depths of it here, but when I belong here, I trust here, I yeah. respect here, I turn up with that. Yes. And then through that, I'm able to make um, connections with people around me. And this is where the mutual care and support comes into place because I care and support here and here. Yes. I, I'm shaking my head ridiculously I have I have a little note on my computer and it says 
am I meeting my expectations today? For such a long time, I measured my value or worth based on how many other people's expectations I had met. And it was really exhausting. And so why do you set it based on expectations? Because that's all about accountability. Why well, this is a work scenario. This is so so quite specific here for me was really work-based. Oh, Julie, you're still going to challenge me. Go. Caring personally, challenging directly. That's fine. I'm here. I'll lean into that because we've built trust and respect and I believe that you'll tell me something because I might I need to hear it. You're still making your measure on task. You're still taking your measure. Now I'm rolling my eyes at myself. Well, I am because it's been critically important to me previously. So I need to make a new pathway around what that looks like. You belong here. I belong here. Yeah. And you trust here, you respect here. You know you do a great job. You know you're good at what you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have the job. Tick. Done. So what are you doing about... Yeah, what are you doing about your environment? What are you doing about, you know, those around you? Are you balancing mutual care and support and accountability internally? Compassion. This is compassionate empathy, right? Yeah. Self-compassion yeah. is balance of logic and emotion. Mm. I know that you're going to produce what you need to produce because you've got those things in balance. Do you need to tick off a list and go tick, tick, tick? Look at that's ego. Yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. We tame her as best as we can. Um, Use her as tactical response. Yeah. It yeah. goes just that, tactical response. There's a whole other conversation. Oh, my God. Yeah. But yeah. Robert Diltz, just saying, putting his name out there, Robert Diltz, ego, soul, his framework in around pathways to success. Amazing because ego, which is spirit, which is whole self, whole mind and things like that, mm -hmm. you know, is the strategic, bigger view community view you know um aspect whereas ego then just becomes this tactical response we need it to be the doer of things yeah but it's not the it's not the all-encompassing yeah yeah well watch this space then julie because there's food for thought for me um and we're learning every minute of every day uh, without a doubt um and it's through genuine conversation with people who have had different careers, different experience and different pathways that help challenge the diversity of thought. And um, I am, for one, very grateful um, and I'm going to have to do some more work on this. Um, <laughs> and, and as I do that, I'll share it with you. Um, yeah, because please I do. My, my mutual care and support back, you challenged um, and, you know, I think I have a, an obligation to say, hey, I heard you. Mm -hmm. And these are, these are some of the things that I've done with that. So thank you. I look forward to that because that's that's where the magic happens, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the, that's the level up. That's the growth. <sighs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Thank you so much, Kate. Welcome back. What a conversation, huh? It's not the first time we've had this type of conversation with a leader who cares deeply for the people that are in their care. One of the things that I want to draw your attention to in this podcast, and you get to see it throughout the way, is a leader that cares very deeply for a people and is learning to introduce the balance of accountability along with it. There are snippets along the way where you could just see this dawning of, oh, that's how I do that. Going from a caring to one of compassionate leadership. Compassionate leadership is a fundamental way of caring for our people and balancing that with accountability. That idea of balancing emotion with logic. When we do this, when we do this well, we can have thriving teams. And there's a formula to it. There's a way of being able to functionally do that, that enables us not to rely on our courage and how much we care, but it relies on us being able to stand in place and own how we're turning up. And Kate Baxter from Little Real Estate, she owns it and she owns it beautifully. I think she's a great demonstration for a lot of leaders of what this can look like. 
Thank you for listening to this podcast. It is a very special one for us. Uh, We don't often get to record these types of conversations with leaders and we look forward to doing much more of that. Thank you again and would love to hear your thoughts on this. And if you've got questions on how this would look for you, we've got you covered there as well. Thanks so much. We'll see you again soon.